Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We just praise and give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord, that we love you, Lord, because you loved us first. So, Father, I thank you right now. I just speak to the atmosphere. And I command the atmosphere to go to a place of glory right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said you watch over your word to perform it. And I charge the atmosphere with the word of God, the power, the authority, and the anointing of God to do what your heart wants to do in this house. Lord, it's not by might or power, but it's by your spirit, I pray, that it's all about you, Lord. It's not about us, but it's all about you. And I just pray for the shalom of God, the peace of God. I pray for a stirring up of your presence. And I pray, Lord, that you would meet every need in this house. You are the great need meter. And I thank you, Lord, that you are a God that saves. You are a God that heals. You are a God that delivers. And Lord, and the bride makes herself ready. And I thank you, Lord, that we need to recognize the things that are so deeply embedded in your church that you want to touch and release your people to a higher and a greater level in you. So, Father, we're not content where we are. We're not content. We know there's a higher level. We know there's a greater power that lies within us that we want to let you out of the box, Lord. So we thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you for the anointing on your word, that your word does the work. And I pray that this word would be a seed that would go deep within the womb of the spirit of your people. Father, you want your people and your church free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and there's a liberty in the name of Jesus. So, Father, I thank you and I just praise you for what you will do. You will watch over this word to perform it, I pray, that you no longer hold back the performance of your word. Lord, you know everyone that is here. You know the need spiritual, physically, and emotional. Lord, you're concerned about the whole man. And I pray, Lord, that every word you put in my heart and my mouth will be like a fire going out to set your people free. Now is the time for the people of God to be free. Time is short. Jesus is coming. We need to be free. So, Father, I thank you for the anointing on the word to set your captives free this morning in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 I'm really not going to uh, try to go too long. I know that many of you were... Uh, in the Bible study this morning, and it was so good to see everybody downstairs, and our worship was glorious, and uh, I just don't want to overload. So, Father, I just thank you that God has put a word in my heart, and uh, I, I, I really played with it in my mind, and I says, you know, Lord, I, I want to really bring something short and sweet. <laughs> And this teaching is not short and sweet, so it's going to probably go for two weeks. And I wanted to change it. I really wanted to change it. But God wouldn't let me change it. He wouldn't let me change it. And I just said, okay, Lord. I even started to bring a, another message in my heart. And God would, God the Holy Spirit would not let me leave this. And I know it's a, a now word. And the teaching is the bomb of Gilead. Now, there's a scripture that many of you may not even be familiar with. In the book of Jeremiah 8.22, the prophet said, Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered or restored? So the Lord is looking down on his bride and I heard an evangelist speaking. He had a, 
uh, healing evangelism. And uh, I read some, some of the articles, and he said when he has meetings, there's so many people. And he says most of the people that come up for healing and, and deliverance are born-again Christians. So this is why the prophet Jeremiah says, is there no physician in the kingdom of God? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Right? The word balm uh, in Hebrew, it means it was a medicine. It was a gum-like substance. It was an ointment for pain. Now, it's amazing. I've read this scripture many times. And we always hear about sickness. We, we preach the word of God, that the word of God is health and medicine to all our flesh. And we, and we focus on sickness. And I see something different. How many of the word of God breeds and it grows? And I seen something that jumped off the page, something I really never ministered on. And it says that the bomb was a medicine for pain. How many ever had pain? You can have pain spiritually. When we were separated from God, we didn't even know, but we had pain of the absence of God in our life. We could have pain physically, spiritually, emotionally, in, in so many areas of our life. Pain is a terrible thing. And if you had pain, you know it's a terrible, terrible thing, and it's not of God. And God hates pain. God hates it. So, hallelujah. Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings or the pains of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So God, Jesus Christ, knew your pain and knows your pain, whether it's spiritual, physical, or emotional. And I think there are many people in the body of Christ that has emotional pain. I see it in the church. I speak to a lot of people. And there is pain, emotionally pain, physical pain, in a lot of areas. And God wants his church to be free. Hallelujah. The Lord felt physical pain. He felt emotional pain. He even spe uh, had spiritual pain when he was on Calvary. And he said, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? He had spiritual pain of separation from the Father the first time in all eternity. That was pain. Pain of an absence of somebody in our life. How many have had an absence of somebody in your life? We all know that. And it's, and it's an emotional pain, isn't it? God wants to bring healing to that because he wants you totally free. That's the Father. Jesus is the balm of Gilead. He is the medicine. In Proverbs 4.22, we're familiar with these scriptures. He said, my words. How many know he is the word? He is the word made flesh and dwelt among us. So I pray that the word that I bring forth will be manifested. He is the word made manifest. He is the word made flesh. That word flesh means he wants to manifest himself to you today to, to show you the things that you need to be delivered from. Because if we are not delivered, we cannot deliver the people out there. If we're not free, we're bound up. We can't set nobody free. How many know that? We need to be totally free. All right? This is a happy message. This is a happy message. Hallelujah. But sometimes we got to expose the work of the enemy before we can recognize it. All right? So, my words are life unto those that find them and health and medicine to all their flesh and to all their pain. He is the bomb of Gilead. All right. 
It is God's will for you to be well. How many know that? God is willing to heal you. He is willing to deliver you. All through the scriptures, they said, God, if you're willing, Lord Jesus, he says, I am willing. He's always willing to bring healing. He never says, says no to you when healing, whether it is emotionally, spiritually, or physically, he wants to heal us. We know that the, the word well here, it's a Hebrew word, and it comes from the word shalom. He wants nothing missing, nothing broken, and total wholeness in your health. He wants to bring, bring recovery to all our pain. How many feel some pain sometime? Come on, we all do, right? Hallelujah. When I wake up in the morning, I decree, and I say it is well with me. It is shalom with me. I have nothing missing, nothing broken. I am totally whole from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. That's a declaration of faith. And no matter how I feel, God is moved by my faith. Because when I speak that, I sound like the spirit of the living God. I sound just like him. You need to decree these things over your life. No matter how you feel, we don't walk by sight or feeling, we walk by faith. And the only thing God is pleased about is our faith. We can go to church until we blue in the face, but if we don't have faith, you'll come into church profits you nothing unless you have faith. So I wanna build up the level of your faith this morning. You know, and uh, Joel 3.10 says, let the weak say I'm strong, let the sick say I'm, I am well. It's not a denial thing. We're not denying it, but we're speaking the way God sees us, that he made the provision for you to be well, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And I'm going to prove it through the word of God. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. It means blameless, faultless, without spot, without pain, no wrinkle at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he wants to bring healing to you, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be total delivered, Amen. total whole. He's coming back for a glorious church. I think about when men want to get married and they want to marry a beautiful bride. Don't you think Jesus deserves all the honor and the glory to have a glorious bride? You know, I think often, you know, we, we and, and it's not put anything down. I'm just saying a man, when they marry, they look for a beautiful wife. They don't, they don't find a wife that says to wife, okay, I'm going to come down the aisle. You know, I'm not feeling good and, you know, you know, you know, you, you don't want that. Either does Jesus. You know, complaining bride and limping all the way down the aisle, and I don't know if I'm going to be a good wife. I don't know if I'm going to make it to the altar. You know, it's almost like the church. Am I right? I mean, God hears what you say. He says, oh, you get out of bed. Oh, I don't think I'll ever walk again. You know, I mean, that's the church. <laughs> he deserves all the glory and honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, in the Old Testament, because of the Passover meal, that God made a covenant with Israel through a blood covenant of the Passover meal with Israel. And the word says, listen to this, in Psalm 105, verse 37, when he brought out millions of Jews from Egypt into the promised land, he said he brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person or sick or weak person among their tribes. When he brought the Jews out of Egypt, there were millions of Jews that came out, all ages, from babies to maybe 100 years old. Remember, Moses was 120, right? So he brought them out. And among all the people, because of the Passover, the blood sacrifice, there was not one sick or feeble. Why is the church of the living God sick 
and feeble and weary. True? Why? Is there no physician there? Is there, is there no balm of Gilead there? Is there no medicine to bring healing and deliverance? You have to fight the good fight of faith. When these things come against you, you don't accept it. You rebuke it in the name of Jesus because God wants you well. You know, things are going to come against you. Do not receive them. Fight the good fight of faith. Say the same thing that God said about your life. He wants you to prosper, be in good health, even as your soul prospers. But I don't believe the church is confessing the word of God. As soon as they feel something, they agree with it. You don't agree with the enemy. Sickness is not of God. Don't agree with the enemy. Speak the word of God, and the only thing the enemy fears is the word. All right? Is the word. Don't pat that. And the more you talk about your sickness, the more power you give to it. Am I right? And then we wonder why we're not healed. Because we're giving power to the works of the enemy. Because Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Hallelujah. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Hallelujah. And the enemy has no legal right to touch you. All right? But sometimes we're snared by the words of our own mouth. Unbelief and negativity and speaking wrong things over our life attracts the enemy. How many know that? When you speak good things, it attracts healing and miracles and signs and wonders. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we see God the Father. I call him Abba Father. That I'm free from orphan spirit. We're no longer orphans. Abba Father, that's his name, is my God. He's my Father. No longer, there's so many people in the church, especially young boys and girls that have orphan spirits because their parents divorced or their fathers left. That's an orphan spirit. But we can cry, Abba Father. We're no longer orphans, but we're the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if any of you are, are you know, coming into a place where you feel neglected or rejected, that could be an orphan spirit. Let God deal with that. Hallelujah. Amen. Revelation 13, 8. It says, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. The provision was already made. The Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the earth. Provision was made for you before there was a problem before you ever had a problem, before Adam and Eve ever had a problem, provision was already made, the blood of God on the altar, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So we're not waiting on God, God's waiting on us. Are you getting it? It's already given, it's already finished. The provision is there for whatever you believe in God for. Begin to thank him for it because he said yes because it lines up to the will of God. Whatever you're believing in your family, whatever you're believing in your life, everything that will glorify the Father, he's already provided it for you. So don't limit him. Don't limit him. We break the limitations. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're going to look at some provisions uh, and the things that he, Jesus Christ, has provided for us. You know, the word of God says, the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. They are amen. It means so be it. The promises of God are yes and amen. So be it. They're already there for you. All right? You have to know your legal rights. You have to know the promises and you have to know the benefits. You know, it's like you have an insurance card, an insurance policy, and you go to the doctor and you have searched out your whole medical information. You know your legal rights, what you paid into. If you go and they tell you you're not covered for that, and you know you're covered for that, you're going to put a big stink up at that desk. Come on, you're going to fight for your rights. We don't fight for our legal rights. We need to fight and know what the benefits are. 
and know what the provision and know what the promises are for you to be successful in life and to be used of God. Am I right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 103, 2, we know it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. You have a coverage, and that coverage is the blood of Jesus Christ. It covers you and gives you the legal right to claim the word of God and the promises, provision, and the benefits. All his benefits, forget not, but if you don't know the benefits, you can't claim them. That's why it's so important for you to be in this word. If you don't know the word of God, you're going to be stuck. You're going to go and agree with what you hear, what you see, and what you feel, and that will deceive you to paralyze your life that you would not be able to go forward. But what does the word of God say? Listen, I am tried constantly for the word that I know. How I many you know the enemy tries you and puts things against you? And what has had to happen, that word of God has to rise up because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Got nothing in, nothing good comes in, nothing good's going to come out. So when the enemy comes in, I know the word of God. I know it. It's an epistle in my heart. And I don't have to run to my Bible. I know the word. You need to know the word because that is going to be your defense in these end days. And the enemy will keep you busy not to get in that word because he knows the authority of that word and the power of it to set you free and everything that you believe in God for. I cherish the word. It's my life. It's my life. It's my life. It's my hope and my future. It's my victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities, all our faults. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He took every generational curse. He took all generational sins and blows. It means that he was bruised. All right, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. He was wounded and he was bruised. Do you know when you can get a bruise, sometimes that bruise goes, cuts deep within. You can be bruised on the outside, but sometimes the bruise goes on the inside. And the many in the church have been bruised and wounded, and it may, may have been in the flesh, but it has affected you spiritually, emotionally, because the bruises go deep. Even from childhood, they go deep, and we don't recognize that they're there. They're deeply rooted, and they're hid. But you know what? I know that when I have, you know, we all have feelings, and we're, we're not perfect yet. And you know, I, I examine my heart, and I say when something comes against me, Lord, is there a root to this? Why do I react the way I do? Is, and I can't get the victory in it. Is there a root to it? And you could put the ax to the root. You know, I think even pride in the church. There's a root of pride sometime, even though we've been delivered from that. But sometimes that can be a stronghold. And pride causes division and strife in families and in churches. You hear? So you know what? If you recognize it, curse the root of it. Put the ax to the root. We're not rooted in, in sin or sickness or pride. We're rooted and grounded in truth. And I speak over myself. You know, sometimes it's hard to love everybody. And I says, well, I'm rooted and grounded in love. I choose that. See, life is about a choice. What is your choice? I'm rooted and grounded in love. I'm rooted and grounded in humility. I speak that over my life because I need to speak that over my life. Decree a thing, it will come to pass. You will have what you say because that's my heart, even though I don't see the evidence all the time. That's what I want, and that's what the Father wants. Examine your hearts. Examine your hearts. Hallelujah. But it says that uh, there are uh, uh, spiritual forces against our lives, and there are spiritual strongholds in our life where the enemy has set camp up in our minds and our thoughts. But God said, when those thoughts rise up, 
first, second Corinthians, cast down those thoughts and every high thing that exalts itself against the, the, the will of God. We're in a battle, people. How many know you're in a battle? We're in a battle, but thank God we win, right? We win. Hallelujah. So I speak about 39 stripes. I heard years ago there were 39 major diseases in the world. How many ever heard that? And out of the 39 major diseases, all other sicknesses come out of. Now, how do we know it's 39 stripes? Well, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, the Apostle Paul, he said, Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes except one. So there's 39 stripes, right? By law and under the law, when they put somebody to the whipping post, if they gave them 40 stripes, stripes, it would have killed them. Nobody can endure 40 stripes. It would have either killed the prisoner or they would have had to put them out of their misery. Under the law, 40 was not permitted. Now think about this. When Jesus was at the whipping post, the soldiers were angry. Picture, picture him at a whipping post. I believe they were drunk. Oh, yeah. They had hate. They had murder. And maybe even demon-possessed. So think about these big soldiers with these whips. And on the whips, there was glass and iron at the end of the whip. And when they hit Jesus, it pulled the skin off him. When they whipped Jesus, it pulled the skin off them, off him. Hallelujah. So there's Jesus at the whipping post, and there's these soldiers, drunk, angry, full of murder and hate. They wanted to kill him because they didn't know the plan of redemption. The enemy didn't know it. Could you imagine if they were so drunk, who was keeping count for those 39 stripes? Who is keeping count? If they would have gave them, Jesus, one more, it could have killed him there. And he would have never went to the cross to redeem the world. Think about that. Forty stripes would have killed him or they would have had to put Jesus out of his misery. But God knew he was greater than the drunk. He was greater than the anger. He was greater than the demon-possessed soldiers that were hitting him out of control. They probably didn't even know what number, but God, in his mercy, because he had a plan of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the reason you and I are here. So it didn't go over 39 stripes. God made sure of that. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 50, verse 6. He said, I gave my back to the smitters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. I gave my back. Nobody took his life. He gave it. He gave it freely. I gave my back. He went to the slaughter as a lamb, humble, because he had you on his mind. 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 You were always in the heart of the Father. Before the creation of the world, you were on his mind. He knew you. He knew you. He knew you. You're important. You're valuable. You got to see yourself important. You got to see yourself valuable. You got to see yourself accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. And some of you don't. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was abused. Now listen. They plucked the the hair off his face. He had shame. They spit on him. You know, Spitting always speaks about curses. I'll give you an example. Raised in Brooklyn among Jews and among Italians. The, the Italian people, when they had a vendetta, if you know what that means, or something, 
what they would do, I've seen it all my life. They would, when they didn't like somebody, they used to spit at them. And what they were literally doing was cursing their life. So they, all through the scriptures, you see where they were spitting on Jesus. They were cursing him. He became cursed for us. They spat on him. Hallelujah. He took our shame and he became cursed for us. He became abused for us. If any of you ever been abused, there's provision for you because those wounds go deep, deep even from a child. Verbal abuse sometimes is worse than physical abuse. And sometimes those words of verbal abuse sets up camp in your emotions. And God wants to free you of this. He wants you free. We all been abused in some area of our life. And sometimes we react in our life because we don't trust people, because the people maybe that we love most were the people that hurt us the most. Come on, is anybody relating to what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Now listen, he took our shame that we could be blessed. During Passover, what they would do is the, it was from out of the blood covenant. They would bring a lamb. They would raise up a lamb in each family. And the lamb had to be no more than a year old. So during that time of Passover, they would bring the lamb without spot or blemish to the high priest. The high priest examined the lamb, not the one who brought it. So when we stand before God, he examines the lamb and not you. He examines the lamb, perfect and holy, and he doesn't examine you. He examines the lamb. Hallelujah. But listen to this. Before they would roast that young, that young sheep, of course, they would kill it, but they would remove the skin from that lamb because under that skin, they can see if there was any, any blemish or anything that wasn't a perfect, spotless lamb. Jesus, perfect on the outside and the inside. So they had to check under the skin to make sure that lamb was spotless and pure before they sacrificed it. Is that Jesus? He was God in the flesh. Never sinned, without sin. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. Okay. Old, Old Testament prophecy, Isaiah 52, 14. As many was astonished, they were devastated at thee. It said his visage, his countenance was so marred, so disfigured, his face was swollen. He looked like an animal. And his form, his appearance, his image and his face was distorted more than any of the sons of men. He took a beating on his face. They punched him. His face swelled up. He looked like an animal. They pulled the beard off his face. That our self-image could be restored. When all, we came to the Lord, our self-image was down. I didn't have a good self-image of myself. How many didn't have a, a self-image? He took the shame that your image could be restored, who you are in Christ Jesus. You are made in the image and likeness of God himself. Your image restored. We've all done things in the past, and we all had shame and guilt, but we're free of it because he's our shame and our guilt offering. I'm free of guilt. I see myself as God sees me. I try to stay focused on how God sees me because sometimes I am my own worst enemy. How many know that? And that's a lie of the enemy. So my image of who God said I am, I walk in that image. 
You too. Hallelujah. Give God praise. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22, 44, get what I'm going to say. And being in agony, Jesus was in pain. He was in anguish. He struggled. How many ever struggled? How many ever had pain? How many ever, ever had sorrow so deep? You know, godly sorrow worketh repentance, but ungodly sorrow worketh death. I had ungodly sorrow for a very long time, but that works death. And when I got that revelation, I had to do everything to come out of that sorrow because I did not want death working in me. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, but ungodly sorrow. So if any of you have any ungodly sorrow, get rid of it because death can work against you. You hear me? We got the joy of the Lord. So, being in agony, he was in pain, he was in anguish, he struggled, and he prayed more earnestly, and he sweat was as it was great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Under great pressure and under stress, pain, and heaviness, sometime medically proven, that blood vessels can break on your forehead. All right? I mean, heard that medically. Under tremendous pressure, sorrow, and grief, blood, your blood vessels can break from tension and pressure. He had that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But in the garden, he said, Lord, Father, if it be your will, deliver this cup for me. And then he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Now, this is what God did, Jesus did, spiritually. He went back to the garden. See, this was in a garden. He went back to the garden in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And where Adam and Eve turned over their will to Satan. See, before you knew the Lord, we were under the will of Satan. We had all his characteristics, didn't we? We were a sinner. Went back to the garden, and he broke the will of the enemy off your life. Now God is in control, and God is Lord, and his will be done in your life. So Jesus had to go into the garden prophetically to go back to the garden to break the will of the enemy off your life, that you have the freedom now to let God's will be done in your life. Wow. Are you getting this? That's powerful. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He reversed the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden when they gave over their will to Satan. Our will was restored to serve the Father. Hallelujah. Bless God. That's why you're here today. It's no longer your will. It's his will being done in you. Hallelujah. His blood flowed so we can be victorious over everything over being overwhelmed, over stress, anxiety, sorrow, pressure, depression. Just one drop of his blood gives us the victory. Just one drop of his blood defeats the enemy. One drop, one drop of the blood, this power in the blood defeats the enemy. So speak the blood. When you get up in the morning, good morning, Yeshua. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I set my day with the blood of Jesus over me. I set my day. I do not dare to go out into this world when knowing the blood of Jesus has covered me. You hear? Because when the enemy sees the blood, it must pass over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
glory to God. We know without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And without the shedding of blood, there's no atonement for your sickness. Being forgiven of our sins and being healed of our sickness is in the atonement. You cannot separate them. God didn't come just to save your spirit and make you suffer emotionally and physically. He came for the whole man, preserved spirit, soul, and body, blameless, like a glorious bride. He's coming back for a beautiful church, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Hallelujah. And that's you. See yourself that way. But know the word of God. Know your benefits. Know your provisions. Know the promises of God. If you don't know them, you can't claim them. You've got to know them. Get them in your heart, and they'll come out of your mouth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 10720. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed some, from sin. I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm not sick. It is well with me. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It is well with me. It's not denial. It's just when things come against you, you have the legal right to remove it in the name of Jesus and by the spirit of the word. Amen. Don't settle for it. Don't pat it. Don't entertain it. Don't say someday it go away. It went away over 2,000 years ago when Jesus took it on Calvary. So why are you carrying it? Why are you carrying it? Rise up. O oh, men and women of God, take authority who you are because the enemy is familiar with you. He knows you by the words that come out of your mouth. He knows you. He's familiar with you. You can't be double-minded, say one day one thing and having a bad day the next and all foul things come out of your mouth. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Stay focused on the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Get it deep in your heart. Let it be rooted and grounded in you, that you know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen. Hallelujah. We are risen with him, and we sit in heavenly places, far above powers and principalities. The devil's under your feet. He's destroyed. He's got no authority. When he comes against you and tries to tempt you with sin or sickness, you put him down. He's defeated. He's got no head. Jesus crushed his head 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. I want to finish this quick. Can you give me a few more minutes? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Matthew 26, 67, because I, I have to finish it next week. It said that there it is. He spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smite him with the palms of their hand. They wrapped him with their fist. There's this, they kept spitting on him. They cursed him that you are no longer under a curse. You are no longer under the curse. You're under grace. No longer under the curse. Read Deuteronomy 28. If you've never read it, it's powerful. The blessings and the curses. When you read those curses, they are, oh, they're overwhelming. And God delivered you from every one of those curses. Don't let pain stay in your body. Fight the good fight of faith. It doesn't belong to you. Jesus took it, and he says in Naaman 1, nine, this affliction shall not come upon his body a second time. You are his body. He's the head. He took it on Calvary. Every sin, every pain, every guilt, every shame, every pain, he took it, and the prophetic word from the prophet Naaman says, this affliction, this sickness, this sin shall not come on your body a second time. Take that word as the sword of the spirit and smite that in the name of Jesus. Cut it down. God is raising up us to be warriors. What does a warrior do? takes the sword of the spirit because what the enemy fears is the word of God. He's got to bow. He's got to bow. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word is God. Get a revelation. The word is God. 
You get that revelation. You read it, but you have a revelation. The word is God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means, and the word was made flesh, and he manifested himself. And I pray as I give you the word, Jesus is going to manifest himself to you in a phenomenal way like you have never known. In the name of Jesus. So they spit and they buffet him. All right? He bore the curse to us. Cursed is everyone that hung on the tree, that we would be blessed. I'm blessed and highly favored. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to finish with this, and then I'll pick it up. I'm remembered. Uh, I remember the word of God, the scripture in, talking about the curse. In Mark 8, 22 to 25, just write it down. I'm going to paraphrase this. Uh, and uh, it said that they brought a blind man to Jesus. And Jesus, seen the blindness, and he spit in his eye. All right? He spit in his eyes. He was blind. And then he put his hands on him, and the eyes were restored and made whole. So Jesus spit. Have you ever got spit in the eye? Okay. There's one in Mark 7, 32 to 33. Listen to this. They brought a man to Jesus who was deaf and had a speech impediment, all right? And Jesus put his fingers in his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue with his spit, all right? I believe it was a deaf and dumb spirit, but he said his ears were open and his tongue was loose. Why? Because Jesus became cursed, and he reversed the curse of deafness and blindness because his spit was holy. <laughs> he reversed the curse. Sickness, deaf and dumb spirits, it's a curse. And Jesus reversed that curse with his spit because he was God in the flesh. Hallelujah. That's powerful. His ears were open and his tongue was loosed. Hallelujah. He reversed the curse that you and I could be blessed. I'm going to end here. So, Father, I thank you for the word. I'm going to finish the teaching next week. Are you receiving what is being heard? You're receiving it? You're valuable? That's the truth of God's word. You know what? You don't get this truth everywhere. They think you're suffering for Jesus Christ when you're sick. You know, well, I hear people say, well, you know, I'm being humbled, I'm sick, and I really think this sickness is glorifying God. I've heard that in the church. Well, then you think about it. If this sickness is glorifying God and it's giving God the glory, why do they go to the doctors and try to get it off? Right? Think about that. Isn't that true? No, sickness doesn't glorify God. You want to glorify God in your body, soul, and spirit, that people will say, who are these people, young and beautiful and vibrant? They don't look like the world. Who are they? Because you got a testimony. You got a testimony. Let that testimony work by taking the word of God and fighting the good fight of faith. It's a war. The enemy knows your weakness, right? Rise up. Don't let the enemy see your weakness. Rise up with the word of God and speak the word of God. When you speak with authority, the devil hears the word and the word is Jesus. And he hears Jesus and he flees in terror. All right? So, Father, I thank you for revelation upon your church this morning that we are healthy, wealthy, and wise. I thank you will go deep within the womb of their spirit and it will bear much fruit. And I thank you for the anointing of God to set your people free. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Give God praise.